Salutations, people. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into the murder cases that went unnoticed by our nation's newspapers. Hello, Shay. Hi, Don. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Welcome back. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, Episode 2, Season 2. I'm going to have to get used to saying Season 2 first. <laughs> Yeah, just just when you finally got it all together for the end of the season, we started a new one, and now you have to relearn it all over again. <laughs> so this week we have a, a really interesting case. Um, it, it actually uh, is the anniversary. The, this episode will air on the anniversary of of the two deaths involved in this case. Well, technically three. But, uh, so we are talking about the February 9th killer. That is the most unimaginative name. Well, I mean, I get where they got the name because... Let me guess, let me guess. Did it happen on February 9th? Yes. Both (sighs) murders happened on February 9th, uh, two years apart from each other. This is the exact opposite of the clown mask, Kelly. Yes, exactly. This is way too literal. (laughs) Uh yeah the uh yeah newspapers dubbed this guy uh the February 9th killer uh and this is a unidentified serial killer. Hold on, was February 8th like a holiday or something? I don't think so. Did they just come in hungover and everyone was like, "Dude, uh I don't feel like thinking of a name for this guy. When did it happen?" Uh yeah, February or February 9th. Hmm. No, no. I'm, I'm still acting. Oh. You just go, February 9th. You go, yeah, that's it. That's the name. The February 9th killer. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, I mean, he really wasn't dubbed a serial killer until the, the second murder happened. Did it happen on um, February 9th as well? Yeah. Two years after the first one. So this week we are going to be talking oh, about... Oh, uh, I, I, was, I thought this all happened on like a single day. A single February 9th. No. Not like these the are February 9th. Apart. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're, we're going to start uh, on February 9th of 2006. And that would be the, the murder of Sonia... All right, all right, so guys, bear with me. Mejia. Sonia Mejia. And that is how it's pronounced, because I, I did check. And the second victim would be Demenia, uh, Demenia Costello. And her death was on two, uh, in on September or blah, 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 February 9th of 2008. So it's, it would be pronounced Castillo. Castillo. I, you know what? I was so worried about mispronouncing the first one that I I checked up the pronunciation on her first name because I was I was so sure about myself on. Well, the, if it, her last if, name. if she wasn't Castillo. Hispanic, it would be Castillo. Oh. But since she's Hispanic, it would be Castillo. Yeah. Darn it! I was so close, guys. So close. So those, that's what we're going to be talking about this this episode. So before we get into our news and then our everything else, we just have a couple of shout outs to give for this episode. Uh, we actually have three patrons on Patreon. Three. Yay. So a quick shout out to Rolf, uh, Chelsea Hargrave, and Stacy Fergal. Uh, thank you guys for donating on Patreon. Uh, to our podcast and uh, we appreciate all of your support uh, if you guys out there want to become a patron of page three killers you can just hit us up on patreon and become one of our prime suspects do it do it now and if you uh if you don't want to or, or you can't at this time uh just remember to like share or subscribe you know, that always helps out. Now let's move into our news. 
So, I mean, we, we remember 2006, right? I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part. Yeah, crazy, crazy world, uh, 2006, I guess. I mean, the 60s were, were way better, but kind of crazier. This, the 60s? Yeah, the 60s were crazy. You don't know anything about the 60s. I mean, you had a lot of 60s. protesting, and I, I just prepared a, an entire episode that's in 1969, so I got the tail end of the 60s memorized. Okay, whatever. In case nobody noticed, my, my mug does match. For anybody watching on YouTube, it does match my sweater. <laughs> All right, so our news for 2006, we're going to start with January 3rd. Uh, we have uh, 12 uh, dead coal miners and one survivor discovered in the uh, Sago Mine uh, disaster near Buckhannon. West Virginia? I I'm, I'm hope I'm pronouncing that right. Buchanan? Yeah, yeah. Looks, that looks like it to me. Tut, tut, tut. Two, two for three. <laughs> now, on January 5th, uh, the Bush administration proposes spending $114 million on educational programs to expand the teaching of Arabic, Chinese, Persian, and other languages typically not taught in public schools. I do remember this one because mm -hmm. uh, the military was looking for uh, translators. Ah, uh, yeah. People that spoke like uh, Arabic and you know other other languages. Yeah. Now, also on January fifth, we have IBM uh, says that it would freeze pension benefits for its uh, American employees starting in two thousand and eight, and offer them only a four four hundred one k. A retirement plan in the future. Uh, a lot like of people were pissed else. off about it. A lot of people got pissed off by that. It's kind of kind of big news. Now on January sixth, uh, we had AOL agrees to pay customers as much as twenty five million to settle claims that they wrongly billed some uh, them for some online services and products. Yeah, do do you remember that happening? I remember this. I do not. My parents got a, uh, well, my mom did, because uh, she had the AOL. I, I, my parents might have gotten it, too. I don't know. Yeah, yeah she got, like, 10 bucks. It was <laughs> probably, <laughs> that, that was about it. Probably cost almost as much as to, to mail them out as oh, yeah. the people receive. Yep. Now, on January 11th, we have Saint, uh, the Augustine Volcano in uh, Alaska erupts twice, making it the first major eruption since 1986. And I believe 1986 was Mount St. Helens. Yep, that was Euro's born. Yeah. I was a, I, I just watched a documentary on that volcano this morning. Uh, the eruption of Ma Mount St. Helens. Super. I read a book about it in, when, uh, when I was in school. Yeah. I mean, we don't usually have volcanic eruptions like mainland USA, so I mean, you get some like in the Hawaiian Islands, which technically are, you know, they're well, they they're volcanic islands, but yeah, so we had a uh, had that a volcanic eruption. Now on February ninth, so this was probably the big news on that day. Uh, AIG apologizes for deceiving uh, business pra for uh, deceptive business practices that reached a 1.6 uh, for 64 billion settlement uh, with federal and state securities and insurance regulators. And then they went and caused the housing crisis. Yep. 1.64 billion dollars was not enough for them to learn their lesson fantastic yep so and i mean that was kind of the the big deal on february 9th that year uh in 2006 so it was super crazy now on february 15th we have a group of uh institutional in investors uh already involved in a lawsuit with the company sue tyco international 
uh, to stop its proposed breakup plan. Uh, I'm too familiar with this. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, you are. I don't understand how they could be, like, it. they were forced to break up. I don't understand how you could sue a company after the government tells them that they need to break up. Yeah. I guess they're, they were pissed off about how it was broken up. I guess they mm-hmm. could do that. Well, when you start affecting people's jobs, it's, uh, you know. Uh, I don't think, I, I think literally not a single human being lost their job as a result of it. So, oh, so, oh, it was the, inv- like the investors in the company, in the major company, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. That, it's not something that I know a lot about, but we're, we're going to move on. It was just a really large international corporation that the government said can't be a as large international corporation. Oh, okay. And they split up into three companies. Okay. And I guess the uh, institutional investors didn't like how they did it. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Now, on April 29th, we have a massive anti-war demonstration and a march down Broadway in New York City marks the third year of the war in Iraq. Do work. Yeah, no. Uh, it, unlike its uh, 60s counterpart, uh, failed miserably. Uh, that didn't do anything. Um, I mean, we literally just pulled out now 20 20 years later no, no that was afghanistan oh uh, yeah we, we still haven't pulled out of iraq have we, we uh, i think technically yeah. we ended it and started a new one. Oh, okay yeah we just we just like to move that war machine somewhere else and you know fight other people's battles right it's the american way yeah <laughs> All right, and then uh, for our Pittsburgh fans out there, uh, you're about to have a cringeworthy one right now. Now, on uh, June 12th, Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger uh, crashed his motorcycle near uh, Pittsburgh's 10th Street Bridge. Uh, He was rushed to uh, Mercy Hospital for emergency surgery. And he just retired, so it's kind of fitting. Oh, he didn't retire yet. Well. Oh, well, he, he left the Steelers, right? No, he still has at least one game to play. Oh, okay. So he As of right now, so you'll know exactly when we're recording this, because the Steelers will probably lose that game. Really? You you don't think they're going to want to win it? No. I think they're going to want to win it. They might want to win it, but that doesn't mean they will win it. Who are they playing against? Kansas City. Ooh. You don't know anything about football. But Kansas City won the Super Bowl. Oh, well, I mean, the Steelers won the Super Bowl. I mean, how long has it been since the Eagles? (laughs) Three years? Four? Four years. Four years. I'm so sorry. I'm not a big sports person. So sue me. Yeah, so I was going to make an inappropriate joke about Ben Roethlisberger, but we're going to leave it there. I'm going to be nice to our Pittsburgh fans out there. So now we're going to move into our CD side of 2006. We have a bunch of interesting cases that came up, um, so I thought you guys might be interested in these. So we have the January 17th, California executes uh, Clarence Ray Allen. And he was executed by uh, lethal injection, and he was sentenced to death uh, in a 1982 for arranging the murder of three people. Yep. On January 30th, we have Jennifer San Marco uh, kills eight people before committing suicide in a postal uh, facility in Golette, California. Uh, San Marco. Uh, had worked at the facility previously, but had been let go due to her erratic behavior. <laughs> Fortuitous. Yes. Um, now, on February 3rd, uh, a series of suspicious fires 
uh, destroys three small churches and damages two others in Bibb County, Alabama. That's Bibb, right? Bibb? B-I-B-B? -B? Bibb? That would be Bibb. Uh, four out of five so far. <laughs> now, we have March uh, 14th. We have the Crystal um, Mangum. Uh, makes false uh, makes the false rape allegations against three members of the Duke University men's lacrosse team, uh, an event which marked the beginning of the Duke lacrosse case. Now we did talk about the end of the lacrosse case where they were all basically found not guilty of doing that, and they, they it was found out that she made the whole thing up, right? No, she was a stripper, and they. She did not appreciate some of the comments they made towards her, so she decided that they she would ruin all of their lives because she didn't like the fact that they were rich kids from Duke and mm. she was a lowly stripper. Yeah. Now, yeah, she definitely shouldn't have done what she did, but assholes don't need to be assholes at the same time. Um, the one that pisses me off is that that. That Brock, Brock one, that that college kid that like raped a girl that was like completely passed out, and he got like six months of like house arrest or something like that, or six six months in in like a minimum security prison, which kind of ticks me off. Now we have March twenty fifth. We have uh, seven die in the Capitol Hill massacre in Seattle, Washington. Uh, perpetrator Kyle Huff's uh, rampage is fueled by his hatred of rave scene gatherings. I mean, of all the things, mm -hmm. people who want to do drugs and dance. Yeah, they're not hurting nobody. Well, they probably were, but that's beside the point. All right, so January uh, 23rd, in Miami, the Federal Bureau of Investigation arrests seven men accusing them of planning to bomb the Sears Tower and other attacks in Miami. Yeah, so this was the, basically, uh, CIA and FBI listening in on people and, you know, apparently foiling a plot to... Uh, set off some bombs in my uh, Is it like the recent FBI plots? Oh, you mean the ones where they... Um... Where the FBI plans it, instigates it, yeah. and then recruits people for it, and then arrests them. Yeah, that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. Or where they plan a gathering, and three or four different federal bureaus all meet, and the only people at the gathering are those said federal bureau <laughs> investigators, and they all try and arrest each other. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow. It was it like that? Do we know? Oh, no, not. Oh, these were actual like people yeah. who were trying these to blow were stuff up. Terrorists. Yeah. Got it. Now we have the August tenth. Uh, we have the London Metropolitan Police make twenty-one arrests in connection to an apparent terrorist plot uh, that involves aircraft traveling from the United Kingdom to the United States. Liquids and gels after that are banned from a check. Uh, checked and carry on luggage. Your three point two ounces of shampoo yeah. are just too dangerous. My my sister got so mad. Um, so one time, it was that it was that trip, uh, down to Florida that my parents and my sister made. I believe on two bottles of sangria. Uh, and they decided to leave at midnight on New, New or uh, Christmas, like right after Christmas, right. It was like Christmas Day. So here's yeah. the issue with this whole thing. <laughs> After, if you bring a bottle, a sealed bottle, of whatever that's too large, mm -hmm. what do they ask you to do with it when you get to the gate? They throw it in the trash. Yeah. So all of these TSA agents who think you have a bomb ask you to pile them all up next to them. Mm -hmm. 
Think about that. Yeah. Hey, if you have a bomb, just put it here. We'll just, you know. Dumb. Well, the whole thing They don't was... believe you have a bomb because if you thought they had your bomb, if they thought you had a bomb, they wouldn't ask to be placed right next to them. It makes no sense. Hey, if you're going to blow something up, make sure it's me. That's what they're saying. Ah, uh, you know makes what? Makes no I, sense. Like I'm not I think what they're trying to do is like they were trying to prevent um a liquid that could possibly be mixed with something else to make an explosion. So, like, if you had two components in separate containers, because you wouldn't obviously want to have something volatile that wouldn't make it onto the plane in the first place, right? So, like, you wouldn't want to do, like, nitroglycerin or anything like that. So instead, they have you throw it in the nearest trash can near everybody. That's what I don't understand. Okay. Well, back to what <laughs> I was saying. My sister got Matt upset because they made her throw away her new bottle of expensive shampoo that she had bought. Uh, so she got really upset about that. Yeah. So, and it was kind of ridiculous. Anyway. So now we're going to roll into our case. So I was telling you guys earlier, back when we first opened this, that the February 9th killer was uh, an unidentified uh, suspected murderer. Uh, he is believed to be responsible for the 2006 murder of Sonia Mejia and her unborn baby, and the 2008 murder of Demina Cas Castillo. Castillo in Salt Lake County, Utah in uh, the United States. The uh, murders were committed on the same day, February 9th, earning him the nickname, the February 9th Killer. Uh, and then they made, like, some distinction, like, to a couple of the articles had, like, F-E-B, uh, like, the abbreviated, and then some had, like, February spelled out completely. So I was like, I don't know if that's a huge distinction. It's basically the same name, uh, except you're abbreviating February. So yeah, it's pretty much the same name. <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, our first case, which would be Sonia Mejia. Now she was uh, five foot three inches tall. She weighed 125 pounds and she had long black uh, and curly hair and dark eyes and she was living in Taylorsville with her common-law husband and her eight-year-old son and she was six months pregnant with her second child she was currently uh, employed at McDonald's uh, and at the time of her death she was 29 years old Uh, she was living uh, at the Fairway Apartments, located approximately on 11th West and 3900 South uh, in Taylorsville. Now, she was home alone on the morning of February 9th of 2006. And uh, shortly after 6 p.m., around approximately 6 p.m., uh, her husband, uh, common-law husband, returned home uh, and found her body... Um, and he quickly called 911 and police were dispatched to the scene. Now, according to court records, uh, I did not actually see the court records. This was from an article. Um, so according to the, the records, uh, he found his wife laying on their bed. She had been gagged with a blue bandana and had a wire garrote uh, that was tight around her neck. Uh, she, What's a garrote? Um, so basically a, a garrote is uh, like some sort of manual choking. So it's like wire that they, and usually it's twisted oh, okay. to, to choke someone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now she was uh, beaten, sexually assaulted, uh, both, and uh, that, sorry guys. 
She was beaten and sexually assaulted before being strangled to death. Now, uh, investigators did find out uh, that jewelry that Sonia had been wearing that day, so she had jewelry that she typically wore. Uh, there was a heart-shaped ring, uh, a, another diamond ring, and uh, a religious pendant uh, were missing from, uh, from her home. Uh, she was also missing her car which was a gold four-door Ford Escort. She had a gold car. She was rich and working at McDonald's. It wasn't a gold gold car, babe. That's just it the It says color. gold car. Gold-colored car. Mm. <laughs> Big had, difference. Listen, she's not walking around like Donald Trump, okay? Come on. Apparently she was. She had a gold car. She had a gold-colored car, okay? When I say gold, I mean gold-colored so ridiculous now it was located four days later on february 13th in the parking lot of the fairfield inn uh, police located a witness who saw sonia earlier that day on february 9th uh the nate in uh this witness was a neighbor of sonia's uh who said that she saw he or she said that they saw a hispanic male talking to her at the front door of her residence at approximately 11.30 a.m. Now, this uh, unknown male ha had been holding a can of soda and a bag of Cheetos uh, as he leaned against her door. As wildly specific. Yeah. I, like, I mean, I guess it seems weird to... This, no, no, I already know the answer. This neighbor was hungry and saw some Cheetos and was like, I want some Cheetos too. This person took an interest in said bag of Cheetos. Because you want, they didn't say it was a Pepsi and Cheetos. It was a Coke and Cheetos. It was just a soda and Cheetos. That soda, she wasn't thirsty at all. Well, I think uh -huh, I did come across some articles that was like, oh, it was a bottle of Coke and then and Cheetos. So we like know I this said, guy. The Cheetos um, are the likes common. Coca Cola and Cheetos. Although I prefer like Pirates Booty to Cheetos. I don't like. I don't really like Cheetos. Well, if you were hungry enough, you'd like Cheetos. That's you true. Just I, like this I, neighbor. I have been known to uh, at work, the vending machine when it calls. <laughs> Yeah, so this unknown person uh, who was described as a Hispanic male was at her door uh, with a can or a bottle of soda uh, and Cheetos. Uh, he then forced his way into her apartment. Now, the witness had observed uh, the man standing very close to Sonia prior to forcing his way in, into the uh, apartment. And at the time, the neighbor witnessed the uh, witness this person assault her and force his way into the apartment right there I just I have to ask why didn't you call the cops if you saw that like now your circus not your monkey yeah I, I guess you know what I do understand people just not wanting to get involved in a situation but if I'm gonna if I see something like that I'm definitely gonna make that anonymous call like come on it's so ridiculous that that this neighbor didn't call uh, call the police. Might have been able to, you know, save her life or something. Now, after entering the apartment, uh, this guy did shut the door. Um, so that's the the end of that altercation, as as we know from the witnesses' standpoint. Now, the su suspect uh, was described as between 20 and 29 years old uh, as a, a Hispanic male uh, with a medium build that and he was approximately five foot six now at the time of the incident his hair was short and combed straight back now police uh, found that Sonia had no enemies and the only motive that they could find for her 
uh, find for the attack was a sexual assault and robbery. Because obviously she was missing items uh, and she was assaulted. Which uh, then led, uh, led them to uh, suspects that she was the... Uh, it led them to suspect that she was the only victim of a random stranger attack. Now, when the police searched the scene, they did find an empty, like an almost empty bottle of Coke and a bag of Cheetos uh, that the witness had described in the breezeway of the Mejia's uh, apartment building. So, like a, a little breezeway area. Uh, they were able to pull a DNA sample, uh, but the DNA sample did come back as inconclusive. And they didn't have anybody to test that against anyway. Now, using more modern technology, a few years later, the police were able to isolate some specific strands of evidence uh, from that sample. Um, but as of right now, uh, so I did see, take a look on their website of open and active investigations. So they and did find uh, her file, which is still open and marked as unsolved. So it, it, they're still actively searching for uh, any witnesses or anything like that, any, anybody who might have seen something that day. So they're still, still searching for that. And I mean, it's two, that was 2006 and it's 2022, so... All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, Domina Castella, Castiano, Castillo. I got it. I got it. <laughs> now, uh, Domina Castillo uh, was born in Mexico City in 1950 and moved to the United States. She was five foot tall and weighed roughly uh, 130 pounds. Uh, she focused her uh, time on her family and always reminded her son that uh, it was important to take care of your family. Now, she lived alone and was a regular churchgoer. And she had two uh, grown children and five grandchildren. At the time of her death, uh, she was 57 years old. She seems like a really, a really nice lady, like, a loving grandma and mom like it's so sad like this guy and I, I watched a, a little bit of uh, a press conference with her son and it was it was really sad now exactly two years uh, later uh, after Sonia's murder uh, we have a Dominia uh, who was attacked and strangled it to death in her apartment. So, same kind of situation. Now, and shockingly enough, she only lived a few blocks from Sonia's apartment. That is not shocking in, in the West slightest. Valley City. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. so that <laughs> means he like lives in that community, which is kind of crazy, creepy. Uh, yeah, terrifying actually. Now, Domina's case did not fit the same profile as Sonia's, um, but given her proximity to Sonia's apartment and the, and the exact date of her murder, uh, gave police a reason to connect the two unsolved cases. Now, on February 9th of 2008, her son... Oh my gosh. Do you want to take a whack at that, babe? I... Isaias? Isaias uh, Gomez, uh, her son. He tried to uh, call his mother uh, several times that day. Uh, she was expecting him to pick her up uh, for work that day. He eventually dropped by, um, but his mom didn't come to the door. So he let himself in using the hidden spirit key that she had. Now, Gomez... Uh, found his mom lying on the living room floor. Uh, she was partially covered with a pillow. Uh, and he told the ABC4 News uh, in an interview that the apartment was a mess. 
Now, he called the police who arrived minutes later. Uh, at the scene, police gathered uh, DNA evidence uh, that they kept and put on file. Uh, now, after analyzing the physical evidence, the police were able to obtain a DNA profile. It was compared to their existing DNA sample from Sonia Mejia's murder. And it was a 100% match to their John Doe uh, suspect. So at that point, they're like, all right, now it's no longer a coincidence that these two cases uh, happened on the same day um, within, you know, mile and a half of each other or whatever. It is definitely, they're definitely linked. It's the same person. So, a little bit about the investigation and the timeline. So, we started off with the murder in 2006 of Sonia Mejia. Now, we have the 2008 murder of Domina Castiano. Castillo. Castillo. Darn it. I'm going to, by the end of this episode, I'll have it. Uh, in 2009, the unsolved murder of Sonia in Taylorsville and Dominia in West Valley City were linked through the DNA analysis. So it did take a, uh, a year for that DNA to come back. Uh, the corresponding police departments uh, joined together and they both released a description of the perpetrator as a Hispanic male in his early 20s. A 20-man task force was established in 2009 uh, to investigate these murders. Uh, in 2010, the DA filed murder charges against the John Doe matching the DNA sample. What I found really interesting about this case was the fact that the DA uh, filed charges basically against the DNA sample. Because we, we were just talking about how, you know. How somehow the. The government has the ability to. Bring charges against inanimate objects. Yep. And uh, it kind of reminds me of that Law and Order episode where it was like a special victims unit or something where they. basically wanted the to they press charges on a DNA sample because the statute of limitations was about to expire on the cases on like five five rape cases like that episode it, so I, I I I wasn't sure if this happened before that came out or after so I, was, I thought that was a little weird but I just found it really interesting that the government could, or the DA could file charges against that DNA sample, and then eventually they can turn around and be like, oh, well, you know, we found the person that matches this DNA sample. But I don't even know if they actually, if they went to trial on this DNA sample yet. Well, it was two years. The statute of limitations, on, there is no, it's a yeah, capital crime. Exactly. There is no statute of limitations. Exactly. So I'm like, I don't get fi the DA filing murder charges against the DNA sample. Um, unless they had a match that they, that they knew of. Which was... Well, they brought it know. against, I guess the way it's worded, it, it says that they brought it against the John Doe. Matching the sample. But they don't have, a, it's a John Doe. They don't yeah. know who it is. So, in uh, 2011, uh, the case is classified as a cold case. So, which is where it has sat uh, since. Except in November of 2018, Salt Lake City District Attorney Sam Gill announced that a suspect was in custody in another jurisdiction and was in the process of being extradited back to Utah to face murder charges. 
Now the district attorney, uh, uh, Sim, uh, Gill, uh, was the person, uh, said the person is serving jail, uh, jail time outside of Utah, but he said that the suspect is unaware he's wanted for murder in Utah. So basically, the second he gets let out of jail, he's going to get arrested? Yeah, kind of thing. Um, for now, his identity remains a secret, from what I can tell. So I thought, you know, oh, there's got to be, like, some newer articles, maybe something's going on on it, but nothing. There's, I, I haven't seen anything new since that 2018 article, uh, unless it was printed, like, really far back. Uh, real tiny. I didn't see anything. Now, for, uh, so, like I said, this guy's identity remains a secret. We don't know who it is. Uh, the district attorney said he is, uh, concerned that if this man ac uh, accidentally is released from jail, he could flee if he has learned that he is facing time in Utah. Uh, the other jurisdiction has agreed to extradite uh, the suspect to Utah. But as of right now, we haven't heard anything on that. Uh, but he also said he is unsure when he will be released from that jail and brought to Utah. Now, family members of the two victims have kept a low pro profile uh, since, the, since this information was released in 2008. Now, as of 2022, the Utah Department of Public Safety, like I said, still has both cases listed as cold cases on their website. I guess just in case he tries looking them up. Yeah. Uh, which leads many to believe that the suspect is incarcerated outside of the United States. That's what I would think. Yeah. So there, there is... Uh... He's in Mexico. So I'm guessing. Yeah, that's what you're guessing? Now, the alleged killer is likely incarcerated in another country uh, since extradition from other U.S. states would be a process that would take w uh, a few weeks or a few months. And also they can do it while he's still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they would just transfer him to another uh, prison. But if he is serving out like a murder sentence or another sentence in another country, they are more likely to... Um, force him to serve out that time, and then release him to uh, other authorities if necessary, you know, kind of thing. Now, so, I am unsure whether he is in Mexico or Canada, because I feel like extradition from Canada is much harder than Mexico, and I mean, two murders and the murder of an unborn child, so... Well, does California have death penalty? Uh, well, this wasn't in California. This was Utah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm not sure about Utah. I tried to look it up, uh, and then I got sidetracked. Not going to kid. Um, They're pretty conservative got... out there, I imagine they do. I yeah. could be wrong, but... Yeah, so, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if he, if he was in Canada, they would not agree to send him back to... The United States, if the state that he's being sent back to has the death penalty, they would make us, you know, say we're not going to execute him kind of thing. Whereas Mexico is, they're kind of like, eh, yeah, you can have him. I so, feel like, I feel like it's Mexico. Yeah. It's a, I feel like Canada would Mexico. be willing to, uh, ex, uh, temporary extradite him for, for trial. I could be wrong about that, but yeah. So, since uh, 2018, uh, the charging documents filed by the prosecutor's office has been amended and then sealed. Um, so, my guess is that they have put a name into that file, uh, and then they sealed the documents from being viewed by the public. So, you can't look at it. They can't, you can't see any of those records now. Can't FOIA request it? Yep. Uh and this usually indicates that there is a name associated uh, with the criminal charges. So I'm guessing it is no longer a John Doe that they have a name. 
but as of right now, it's uh, unsolved. Or it's solved, but unsolved. In the, in the essence of that there's been no name disclosed. Um, it's solved, we just don't know the answer. Yeah. So, as of today, uh, there's no update from the district attorney of when uh, this individual will be facing charges for the murder of basically three people. So, what do you think? <laughs> Let's not be uh, too much here. Let's not. About what? <laughs> what? What is that for? Sometimes you're inappropriate. That's all I'm saying. I was going to be really, really inappropriate, but I won't be. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I don't know. Do you think serving time in a Mexican prison or a U.S. prison would be better? Uh, Which here. one's better? Here? What if you were, like, serving, like, in Angola? Angola uh, is one of the worst prisons in the in the United States. Probably still here. Or Sing Sing? Here. Um, the answer know. will be perpetually here. I don't think there's a uh, a Although, prison in Mexico that I would rather be in. Yeah, I, yeah, no. Like, I mean, if, if I was going to be in prison, I would probably want to be in, like, a prison over in Europe, maybe? France, or... No, you um, want to be in a Scandinavian prison. Really? Yeah. Why? Because they're pretty, uh, lax isn't the word I want to say, but they're very devoted towards rehab rather than uh, punitive. Yeah. Hmm. Where, uh, Mexico's the exact opposite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we already had, we had one case. Um, that we did talk about. She was in a Mexican prison. We we're pretty sure that somebody broke her out and then killed her. Um, that would be our notorious lady of luck, Sharon Coon. I don't believe that she was. I I wouldn't classify that as she <laughs> broke out. Or yeah, she. They was, broke in. And they broke kidnapped, in, her kidnapped her and killed and, her. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That was a crazy one. That one was a really long episode. If you guys uh, check that one out, it's in our first season. It, it That one's a pretty crazy case. The fact that, you know, she, her warrant is still open in the United States for her arrest is crazy. Yeah, because she's uh, almost assuredly not alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that is everything that I have on the February 9th killer. And like I said, this is going to come out on... The anniversary of uh, the murders. So, uh, yeah. Super sad. This was a sad one. Yeah, guys. So, we will see you next time at what? Same, same time, same place? Wednesday at 6 o'clock in the morning. That's when <laughs> we'll, we'll hear from you next. Or you'll hear from us next. Yes. And we'll contact you. And our next case will be coming back to Pennsylvania. Ha! Yay! Another Pennsylvania case. I love. You know PA what? Cases. Now that I'm thinking about, it, we should have started off uh, season two with something local. Oh. But we're terrible at that type of stuff. So. Yeah. Well, no, I re I got super excited about uh, the research for the first episode. And that was, I had to do it. <laughs> right, we could have done the Levittown Head. Right, yeah, that would have been cool. I, I, I actually couldn't find anything on that. Really? Yeah. Huh. Oddly enough, I found like, uh, like half of an article, and that was it. I'm like, maybe I could get uh, my friend's brothers to come on, because they're the ones that found it. But yeah. You know what, the, the one I could have done? Cosmo DiNardo. I don't know who Cosmo DiNardo is. You don't know who Cosmo DiNardo is? Is Look, he from Levittown? He is from Bucks County. Um, He was the one that murdered, uh, like, three guys with his cousin. 
And then his cousin, like, flipped on him and was like, yeah, he he killed these guys and made me help him get rid of the bodies. Oh, this is the, uh, yeah. the, oh. The Lost Boys case. Yeah, we can't, pot- like, that goes against the ethos of our entire podcast. That, th- there's literally <laughs> movies, like, recent no, movies no... made about it. There, there was one documentary. Yeah. That, okay. That was the headlines. Yeah. Nationwide. They were. Yeah. It was a, it was a super crazy case. Uh, yeah, I will find us a, another local one. Um, but the next one is going to be out near uh, Penn State. Out near Penn State. That's all I'm saying. So we will see you guys back here next time for that case. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode and will join us next week. Have a nice week, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.